Hello and welcome to The Dentist Show and we are live on YouTube or Dana Network. If you haven't subscribed, click that subscribe button. If you are live watching me at home um, on Facebook, make sure that you follow Denta Show, click on the follow button. Today we are doing a part two of opportunities in agriculture. You wanted it, I'm bringing it to you live right now. Um, so, you know, as you know, last two weeks, I think it is, we had a beautiful conversation with one, the minister of um, Liberia, who is, um, you know, a rice farmer and somebody that has passion for agriculture. Um, we had other guests on who are um, coming on again. And we've got another doctor who's a food specialist who's going to be talking to you about, you know, the supply chain. What else can you do to add value to your crop? Um, and so I think it's a really, really important conversation, especially this time, COVID-19. What can we do in this space? Food, food security. Is there going to be a shortage of food? What is the situation when we talk about agric? Agric is very big, it's huge. And so today I want you to you know, relax, get your popcorn out, get your drink out and, you know, take your book and your pen. Because last time we had a lot of people taking notes um, and you are definitely going to be taking notes today. I think it's a really, really important topic. In Ghana, we import more than 2.4 billion worth of food annually. And we import rice, sugar, wheat, poultry, you name it. Imagine if that money was invested in Ghana. Imagine if we were actually the ones making all of these products and supplying it to, you know, the 30 million people in our country. Where can we get in and stop this 2.4 billion that is every day going out to other places? Well, I'm gonna be speaking to Davis, I'm going to be speaking to Dr. Mavis and I'm going to have Bertis on here. So I'm going to get them to introduce themselves and we will get the conversation going. So let me have Davis. Davis, yeah. how are you? I'm good. I'm good. And are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. And uh, congratulations. You are doing a good work for Ghana. I mean, oh, I guess, so yes, fun. moving again to another level is one thing we want to see. And I think that's exactly what you are doing. Thank so you. we want to thank you. Yes, thank yes. You, you know, um, Davis, you're known to be, you know, an award-winning, one of the largest farms in Ghana when it comes to mango. I know you do a lot more other things, mm -hmm. but tell us a little bit more about what you do and who Davis is. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is Davis Kobo. Everybody knows me. Uh, electrical engineer by profession, but I don't practice it. I'm a full-time farmer. Uh, uh, basically, I started farming in 2007. Yes, and uh, 2006, so 2000, 2005 actually, with a tick plantation. Then I diversified to go into a cash crop and uh, livestock. So 2007, I became a district best farmer. Uh, 2008, I became a national best far mango farmer. 2009, I became overall national best farmer, the youngest in the history of the country. Then uh, 2010, I became the young, the national young entrepreneur agri category. I serve on, uh, I used to serve on the university council for faculty of uh, agri and consumer science between. 2010 and 2016. In fact, the current uh, finance minister was my board chairman. Wow. Yes. And, uh, yes. and um, uh, I, I serve on other boards. Uh, I'm the advisory board chairman for Farm Radio International. Uh, I also am uh, associate partner for uh, Right FM. The, we started a group. In fact, the, my radio station basically introduced a Greek radio uh, in this country. And uh, it's an wow. award-winning radio station as well. I serve on the school, uh, Agriculture School Council, uh, also Hotty Fresh. I'm an advisory board member for Hotty Fresh. Uh, I serve on a couple of boards. Wow. Uh, I am into mangoes. Currently, we, I, I have three different areas. I'm in the eastern region, Somenia, to be specific, mm -hmm. uh, where we do mangoes. When you go to the northern region, Dabuya, to be specific, we also do mangoes, maize, and sogum. For Guinness, uh, you go to Nabrongo, we do mango maize, 
and so good for Guinness. And I do a bit of rice in both Parigu and uh, the South here. Okay. And so that's David's combo. Yeah, I'm, I'm married anyway with two children. Yeah. With two children. And, and your children, how old are they? Uh, I have four and eight. Four and eight. Yeah. So they're not yeah. the ages of, of getting them into to agriculture yet. I, I think my daughter is uh, very interested. I'm sure. uh, so I started doing phytosanitary compliance and product development, working with small scale fishing operations. Uh, what I do, just to, uh, fast forward to present day, what I do with that is that, um, and, and the particular with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in Ghana, is, is uh, advisory around strategic operational issues that affect food security in Ghana. So particularly if we look at the COVID-19 situation right now, um, I put together a comprehensive plan to address uh, one of the strategic hot button issues that we could address with immediacy to ensure food security. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that's vitally important uh, to look at as strategy. And this is something that um, I do for the Tony Blair Institute and um, I've been doing historically, but but uh, our offices with the Tony Blair Institute, uh, which we have 14 of them, actually have been actively working around Africa to address this issue for a lot of different um, democracies in Africa. So uh, prior to the COVID-19 situation, I was working with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture on how to uh, build select value chains and to bring in investment for those value chains and to put in the right operational systems that would support this um, uh, from top to bottom. And to try and look at those uh, private investors, either overseas or, or locally, that would be interested in select dynamic projects that can improve food security for the country. Fantastic. Wow. You have a lot of experience. I mean, 25 years is a long time. And, yeah. and, and you just yeah. don't have the passion for the industry is very, very inspiring. Now I'm gonna bring on Dr. Mavis Oreku Asari, who is a food specialist. Um, Doc, please tell us a bit about, you know, what is a food specialist for one and what other things are you doing? Okay, thank you very much, Denta, for having me. Um, and uh, good evening to the other others on the panel. Uh, yeah. Very, very experienced people. Mm -hmm. I think the interview last week, and it's uh, I'm I'm glad to be here to share you know some thoughts with with along with you. Um, so I am a food scientist by profession. Um, a food scientist is basically um, somebody who looks at food in a scientific way, if I should put it. I don't know how else. You know, we look at food differently. Um, yeah. We try to see how um, we can add value to food. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at different technologies that we can use to extend shelf lives of food. Uh, there are different aspects uh, when it comes to food science. Uh, I don't want to bore you too much. Food chemistry, food physics, whatever. I mean, it's so many dimensions, you know. So you, it's always a good thing to find a niche, you know, where you feel you're comfortable. And I tend to focus on um, uh, post-harvest management of a of uh, different agricultural produce. So I specialize in fruits and vegetables, um, okay. adding value to fruits and vegetables, but I also work with other products. And I would, I would define myself as a passionate food scientist because I'm very passionate about what I do and I do not um, uh, make, you know, so I, I make uh, the science of food very practical. I work with indigenous settings, indigenous foods, traditional methods of preserving foods. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm currently the uh, manager of uh, Radiation Technology Center, mm -hmm. which is uh, a center under uh, Biotechnology and Nuclear Agricultural Research Institute, mm -hmm. one of the institutes, uh, institutions on the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. So mm -hmm. basically at this center, we do have uh, a technology um, which I would call gamma irradiation technology that we use to um, uh, more or less uh, process food in a way that extends the shelf life of food, add value to the food. So we use this along um, uh, the value, value, uh, value chain 
um, to enhance the quality of food. We worked on so many products. Um, one that is worth mentioning is um, yam, because I, I have a lot of people who are interested in that product, especially those who want to export um, over overseas. And um, research that we have done with this product using this technology um, has, uh, has been very impactful in the sense that we've been able to extend the shelf life of yam to about six months. So what we did at some point during the research about seven years ago was we bought lots of yam from the open market and um, we brought it into a yam bar and we treated with this technology. And um, when, so when the yam was in season, we were able to buy the yam and do the research. And then we were able to extend the shelf life of, of, of these yams. And when it was out of, course, of season- How long? How, how long were you able to- Six months. Six yes. months. Okay. No sprouting, no decay. You're wow. able to to, to um, you know, keep the yam in its uh, in in in, uh, in in its um, more or less uh, fresh state. Yeah. Yeah. So we really. Do you, think it's an issue, do you think it's an issue that we have in Africa? Is the shelf yeah. life and how to preserve products? Yes, because we see high post harvest losses you know, along the value chain. And that's a huge challenge for Ghana. I always say that um, we seem to have put a lot of emphasis on production, production, production. Let's produce mm -hmm. quantities, let's increase the yield, let's improve varieties. But at the same time, we're seeing high losses. Mm -hmm. You know, you're producing and then you're losing so much, um, up to about 50% in some, uh, with some crops. Wow. So it's a very important to address those issues with appropriate technology, convenient technology, upscale technology, whatever you may call it. But um, with a special technology, we've been able to process uh, different products and enhance the quality so that it's available um, and it's of a better quality and more shelf stable. So uh, in a nutshell, that's basically what I do. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me on today's show. So I'm gonna delve into my first question. Um, and, it's, you know, I'm going to get everybody to answer as much as possible. But I'm going to start with you, David. So I'm still in the diaspora. I am 25 years old. I am interested in getting into agriculture. Um, I have no knowledge of the space, but I know that everybody's talking about agriculture. And so I'm getting excited about it. What advice is agriculture actually for everyone? Um, or is there particular segments of agriculture that we can all be part of? Okay, is there a question for me? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much. I think uh, basically, let me also thank uh, Dr. Mavis. I think he, he she, she said a couple of things, she touched on most of the things that, uh, for me, is very relevant if you talk about agriculture, especially with the post service losses. And that brings me back to your question. Is agriculture for everyone? The answer here is yes and no. Uh, yes, because everybody is a human being, and uh, so long as you have strength, you can think uh, you should be able to embark on agriculture. No, because it's not for the undisciplined ones. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to have one, the passion, you need to be very disciplined in terms of time bound and other things before you can succeed in agriculture. The one thing is people, uh, uh, I don't know how they, they, they understand agriculture. When they talk about agriculture, everybody thought it's only tilling of the soil. But that is not the agriculture. Agriculture is a whole value chain. Mm. It's a whole value chain from tilling of the soil, logistics, input dealership, certification, uh, value addition, a lot, a lot, a lot. So if you really want to go into agriculture, you need to look at where you think you can well fit in. Instead of you going, instead of because everybody is producing maize, you think that, look, that's where the money is. It's a cash cow, so you want to go into it. I think that wouldn't work. I tell people that the best fertilizer to agriculture is your own footprint. It doesn't matter any part of the value chain. If you don't have the passion, and if you don't have oversight responsibilities, if you don't understand the trade itself, it becomes difficult. Who knows? Agriculture is equally uh, to oil business because for us in mangoes, for instance, you, you are trading. I mean, you produce and you trade. So basically, you need to look at the market dynamics and see where you have to cash in, where you have to slow down, and a whole lot, both everything. So it, it, it needs your all. It needs your all to be able to do that. 
this is where I think that the youth can play a major role. And again, I'm seriously against when politicians ask the youth to go into, every youth to go into agriculture. That is not the case. Because if you really want to go to, the youth to go into agriculture, do they have mentors? That is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. They need to see, have people to mentor them. They need to have people to mentor them, show them the way. Because if everybody said, look, tomatoes is good, and everybody moves into tomatoes, they will start talking about glass. You understand? But we can still have uh, other varieties that will make uh, penetrate the market well, but with low preservative losses. But then if everybody move into one variety without studying which one meets the market, because now the issue here is it should be market driven. It's not you are not supposed to produce what you want to feed the market, but what the market requires is what mm -hmm. you have to do. And this is where I think that we should be extra careful. But then, you see, one other thing is agriculture, whatever uh, on the value chain, the entire value is very capital intensive. Mm. It's very, very capital intensive. We, we, don't get me wrong. Uh, we're not scaring people from not embarking into agriculture. But then again, you need to have it right from day one before you start. Because it is one other venture that you can cut corners. If you are not able to invest your all, if the investment should take one city and you decide to do 80 pesos, you still lose. You understand me? It will even be better you do one city 20 pesos. That will give you better margins than you cutting corners to do 80 pesos. You still won't, I mean, recoup your investment. That is one other thing. And this is where we are, where we you live in a country, for instance, let me talk about Ghana, where the banks are basically charging between 28 to 32 percent interest rate per annum. And even though you don't, you don't even grant it that somebody goes for the 28 to 32 percent. They, they tell me short-term loan. I mean, from day one, when they give you the finance and they expect that the following month you start paying, irrespective of whatever you do on the value chain. And if banks are even ready to fund agriculture, they, they, they don't fund the entire value chain. They are looking at the, the, maybe the input dealership, they are looking at the off-takers. But what about the production itself? Mm. What about the production? What about the processing? The processes. Why don't you? Because it, it is a whole value chain mechanism where I produce, I have the market to be able to send it for somebody to add value to be able to curtail for service losses and the likes. So if we are not able to study dynamics very well, it becomes very, very difficult. I, I led, uh, how do you call it, the, the then EDIF team to Israel, uh, to Brazil, I mean, uh, by the invitation of one of the biggest buyers. MWW, they are in England, they are, and also fruit, they are my buyers. And when we go to Brazil, uh, we, we basically had to inspect a couple of farms. After we, we entered a particular farm, farm uh, the, the person is Irish, he's well known on the international market. So after the successful stories, then, then they, they asked him, and at that time, uh, Mr. Tony Otigensi, the cable meter, he was part of the board. So he puts a question to the guy. That look, you have fine stories and other. Do you have any regrets? All of a sudden, his world did not change. You could see from his mood and other things. So everybody was curious to listen to what he was going to say. Then he said, This country, he, he, he was referring to Brazil. If you want a loan to do anything on the agriculture, it takes you as long as two good weeks. Then I, we asked, What? He said, Two good weeks. I said, Then he, he came and said, 14 good days. I wanted to talk, but think you said, Davis, hold on. Then he said, they give you the loan as high as five good percent. I said, my friend, hold it there. <laughs> you understand me? Hold it there. In my country, it should take it two years. It's like 30%. Yeah. And, 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 and almost 30%. You understand me? And he was surprised because... Complaining he, about, so he was complaining about his 5%. Exactly. And he said even a 5%, if government had to subsidize, they don't subsidize up to 30%. I said, my friend, don't talk. You understand? You are talking about 5%, you are talking about subsidy, and you are complaining. And even two weeks before you get a facility. So we asked him, so for how long? So, and they won't give you the facility more than five years. I said, my country, they give you the facility today. Tomorrow morning, you see somebody knocking at your door. They, they, they want you to start paying. Do you understand? So this as well. And this, you see, the market is the same market for all of us. We all exit to the same market. So the competition becomes very keen. 
the competition becomes very, very, very key because you are disadvantaged. I mean, your a financial disadvantage, I have a infrastructure disadvantage, and a whole lot. But then, if you talk about Ghana to be specific, we, we have so much advantage. I mean, six hours we are in Europe, I mean, 12, 14 hours we are in the US. And if you are going by sea, I mean, 14, 15 days you are in Rotterdam, 18 days you are in Philistoport. You understand? So, we should have been, and we have all the rivers, we have the land, we have the weather to our advantage. But then, are people doing enough? To, we have a lot of infrastructure deficit which we need to fix. Because, for instance, I'm farming, but I need to create my own road to, to my farm. I need to send my whole electricity to the farm. These are public goods, which I think that is so capital intensive. So, I think from day one, if I even uh, source for funds from any bank, I have to lock almost 50% of the money in, in, in said public goods. So, in the, from day one, I become disadvantaged. Mm. Yeah. So I think that for, for me, agriculture is, is is the backbone of our economy. That is what everybody says. But it's really, really the case. Uh, and that is where I'll, I'll leave it for the agenda to up. Because, and again, if you look at currently, as we speak, COVID-19 is creating a lot of problems. If you go to the ports now, the, especially the Kotuka, the, the cargo flights that are coming are limited. Mm. And and, and afraid that we're paying for one dollar twenty cents is now two dollars eighty five cents. Some I even want to charge three dollars fifty cents. Yeah, no, three dollars fifty cents. This as well. But thank God, I think just last week, the Ghana's World Promotion Authority, uh, I mean the farmers appeal exporters appeal to the Ghana as well Promotion Authority, and uh, we've been granted a permit by 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 the presidency to bring. Airline, I mean, for the industry to bring airline themselves to be able to control. They say we are holding up post COVID that it will still work. And uh, so that is it. I think agriculture, yes, but let's still look at the entire value chain rather than restricting ourselves to only tilling of the soil where we think that that is the only means to get agriculture. But in any case, if you add the youth now, they'll be more interested to go into other parts of the value chain than tilling the soil. Wow. To be more than yes, because process because how many people can sacrifice to till that? So I started with tea plantation. Mm. I wanted the kind of tea plantation, which for me is a social security. And for me, the mistake I did with tea plantation is where I established it. Do you understand? And this has all the, I mean, we work as a working encyclopedia where we should be able to disseminate information, teach the youth what is good and what is bad in agriculture because if. Uh, I knew at that time, and I established my take in the forest belt. I would have been harvesting by now. Mm. And I established the same thing in Somalia, where the rainfall pattern is a bit erratic than the, the other parts. You understand me? So from take, then I moved into uh, Kalpi before even moving to Ga uh, mangoes, and today here we are controlling the mango industry in Ghana. So I mm. think for me, agriculture is a noble venture, but then if you are not disciplined, don't even start. That is one thing. Wow. Yeah. Fertis, if you're not disciplined, don't even start. What are your views on whether, you know, the youth should get into agriculture and is it for everyone? I couldn't agree more with, with David. Uh, I just want to say uh, uh, it's, it's great to see you uh, delivering an uh, address on the show here and breaking down the science for people. The reality is it, it, you, you're spot on. But there are great opportunities for those that don't actually want to be farmers, uh, as the doctor uh, Mavis also mentioned. But there are so many other areas in the supply chain and the overall value chain that need to be unpacked. Um, I personally uh, have taken a great interest in looking at small scale industries and cottage industry development, uh, particularly in Ghana, for what I do. Um, a lot of people say, oh, you know, we want investors from the outside to come into Ghana and invest heavily. Yes, we do. Um, there are some very good examples of that, of some amazing monocropping operations doing pineapple and all sorts of other wild and wonderful things. That's fantastic. Um, but the, the real interest for me in Ghana is developing uh, the small scale uh, operations to be more effective, to cater to uh, issues around food security 
and building cash crops as well. You know, there's a lot of coordination issues that need to be addressed. For those young people that want to get involved, one of the biggest issues, um, as I mentioned, is cottage industry and small scale value addition uh, opportunities, but also cooperative coordination. A lot of people need to understand uh, the value in cooperative uh, development operations. The most amazing cooperatives I've worked with are in Kenya. And I think it's a representative model for probably most of the African continent. Um, Kenya has put together such comprehensive measure of agricultural cooperatives that they also own uh, bus lines, buildings, uh, uh, building societies. They're doing amazing. <clears throat> they're doing amazing things by reinvesting in themselves, and mm -hmm. I think that model is is really really beautiful. And I think it could be replicated in a lot of places. Um, so, for young people, understanding and building this cooperative coordination piece is vital, so that people begin want to trust and work with one another, but also coordinate in different elements within the value chain from the truck, from planting, from the post-harvest, uh, from storage to um, to post-harvest production and producing product lines, uh, product lines that suit the taste and preferences of Ghanaians and other West Africans um, uh, in the region. This, this is a hugely important opportunity. And when I think of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, I really think that this is a, a, this is an area that really needs a lot of assistance, know-how, and understanding how to build cottage industries. Um, I can tell you, and social enterprise is, is a big buzzword nowadays, but to mm -hmm. me, it's no different than cooperative development. It's no different than uh, some of the other uh, group initiatives of communities coming together to solve problems within their communities. We know in Asia they do this often, so you'll have uh, a group handling the, the actual growing system. You'll have, have a group handling the actual uh, uh, harvesting and storage, and, and then the post-production side of it, which they've been at a particular amount of ingenuity to, to meet the taste and preferences of the community and the larger community. And Thailand is also a great example of this. What Thailand has done is amazing in this. I'm, I'm mentioning these different countries because the, the models are, you, you can't question, they've, they've done a great job. Now, I'll give you an example. Thailand is now embarking on a huge initiative um, that is dedicated to value addition in the country. They want to be the leader in Southeast Asia to control all of the agricultural value addition uh, in the region. So they're, uh, they're purposing their entire environment to focus on this. And they have a history of doing the cottage industries to get there. They have a history of, of producing it in very cheap ways. Sometimes don't always meet the final sanitary requirements necessary for export or something, but for local market, great. Um, I think these opportunities for youth are vital. Uh, I would take rice. We know that they work with rice and they have wizardry and rice for all sorts of things. Um, uh, also for fish, from fish balls to all sorts of uh, different types of snack foods that are uh, on 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 display when you go visit them, uh, that side of the world. That these types of opportunities exist in Ghana and in West Africa as well, and I'd like to see more of it standardized, packaged, and and put together put together perfectly uh, in a more dynamic method to meet the needs of those at the lower end of the economic spectrum and those that have a fair amount of money that can afford the more expensive foods and the rest of it. Um, I think this is where opportunity lies. So I'm dedicating uh, a lot of my time to look at small scale industries and value addition um, and the systems and the know-how and the different value chains to show people exactly what to do, how to do it, the types of equipment, the types of money required uh, to, to, to buy the equipment Mm. Uh, um, and and how to make it, and I think this is this is what is a missing component uh, in this entire uh, scheme of things. Sure, we can be primary producers, 
do produce cassava, we can produce tomatoes, we produce this or that. But if we don't add any value to it, the post-harvest losses and all the other issues associated with it, you know, it's, it, falls, it falls down. And um, now that a lot of people are looking internally as countries, this is where the action is. So when I think of cocoa, I put together a magnificent piece that I'm really pushing um, uh, for cocoa, which is the center of excellence. There's only one center of excellence in cocoa in the world, and it's in Switzerland. And they don't have cocoa. Why is it in Switzerland? Well, Nestle, yeah. Okay, fine. But in my opinion, as a representative crop in, for, for Africa and the world, as a confectionery delicacy, that center of excellence should sit in Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire mm. as a brother and sister. And it should be a tourism draw. And I've created, a, I'm creating a mechanism around that that will create, it'll be a revenue spinner in so many different complexities because that center of excellence will provide a couple of different things. Now, um, it'll provide uh, the types of things that, that people need, phytosanitary testing, packaging, labeling, compliance, the list mm -hmm. goes on. So people understand uh, th that small-scale industries can really grow. They would come and visit. They can come and rent the equipment. So these are the types of models that I feel really add tremendous value to a, a crop, cocoa, cocoa that could – uh, really uh, transform an entire sector, and you can have cottage industries grow out of that, small-scale industries, uh, confectionery operations, and the rest of it. And the beautiful thing to all of this is that cashew, uh, groundnut, peanut, coconut, mm. um, dried fruit, all of it ties into confectionery in a beautiful, beautiful way. So how would you marry all that with cocoa? This is how you do it. And so... These are the types of structural platforms that um, actually are not terribly expensive, but add tremendous value down the value chain for several value chains and also improves the overall uh, phytosanitary compliance, product development, packaging, natural packaging styles and all the rest of it, uh, and, and, post -har and eliminates post-harvest losses and creates jobs ultimately. So these are the types of things that I would like you to think about as well on how to take advantage of something like this. Okay. So that's just so that's just one example and that's something that I'm I'm very much busy with. Absolutely. I think it's I think it's great. Um I'm going to move on to now to Dr. Mavis. What are your views on agriculture and the youth getting involved? Is it for everyone? Okay, thank you Denta. Um, well, when I say agriculture, uh, like I would like to put it, I look at the whole value, you know, chain, not just farming, but then there's so many components, like uh, most of the, I mean, the guests have, have, have talked about. Um, agriculture is the backbone of development. Sometimes I don't know if we say it just for saying sake or we really believe it. it. <laughs> but it is because we, we realize that most of our... Um, uh, uh, incomes are generated in agricultural related um, jobs or, you know, the, the agricultural sector in its form, you know, right from the farm till the food gets to the, uh, you know, the plate. Along that chain, um, that's what is driving the economy in, here in Ghana. And so it is the backbone, you know, of development in here in Ghana and Africa as a whole. Um, it is an attract attractive space, in my opinion. Unfortunately, um, it hasn't been, the perception uh, in the past has not been too good in terms of what you could make of agriculture. Like we said, we, we, we limit, when we talk about agriculture, we think it's the uh, whole and the catalyst, you know, uh, method. And yeah. so a lot of people uh, seem to uh, think that is still what it stands for, but it, it's, it's evolved over time. It is a, a very profitable space, in my opinion. And I do not agree entirely uh, about, you know, agriculture being very capital intensive. I will explain why. I, I appreciate that uh, um, um, comment or, you know, that it is capital intensive, but I also believe that you can start with whatever, you know, uh, as little uh, um, as, as possible 
and then move from there into something big. I think what he was referring to is his kind of setup, you know, requires a lot, a lot of money and a lot of capital. But I always want to encourage people who want to go into agriculture to also um, work with the little that they have. Um, I've seen uh, production in some countries uh, being evolving, you know, just not from uh, evolving from just uh, on farm to um, containers. Like people are growing crops in containers. People are growing crops. Um, and we talk about hydroponics. I know somebody here in Ghana who is growing strawberry from a very small greenhouse, mm. you know. So there's so many ways um, to look at how to get into that space. But technology is very important. Resources expertise, um, getting help, uh, you know, to know exactly what to do. All these are important um, aspects, you know, to help the youth who want to go into agriculture. And so if we try to meet them halfway, even halfway with all kinds of um, ingredients that they need to venture into the space, I think they will succeed. I want to focus a bit on um, agriculture as on-farm, you know, production itself. And I'll talk a bit about after production, that is post-harvest. If you look at um, the way we grow our crops here in Ghana, mm -hmm. it is time that we, 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 we change it. We cannot continue. I mean, the soil is not um, the way it used to be in the past. We're having issues with um, insects, locusts, um, invasions. I mean, things are changing. The climate is changing. So yeah. even to start with, we need to project, you know, some form of technologies to these young ones who want to go into. So even for a start, you know, we need to kind of orient your minds that you, if you want to go into agriculture, don't look at it like the way it was done in the past. Okay. Have a new way of viewing, you know, agriculture. Do the research that you can. For instance, you want to grow vegetables. Land is an issue here in Accra. All the vegetable farms, I live behind Craig Fair, and we, it, where I live was a farm. Actually, it was a vegetable farm. And all these places have turned into, uh, you know, um, residential areas. So to start with, you don't even have available land. You know, I have a lot of people, so I consult for, for entrepreneurs as well. And I have people come to me, they want to farm. They just can't find the land. So wow. how do we kind of help them? to accept the fact that they need to look for other ways to even grow the crops. And that's where science comes in, that's where technology comes in, and that's where um, um, uh, innovation also comes in. You know, So it's very encouraging. I was in, uh, I was in the US for a conference and there's this uh, woman, uh, she's a, actually a, a veterinary doctor, and she had decided to venture in agriculture. And you know what, she has one acre plot at one corner of the plot, she has her house. At another plot, she has she keeps a bit uh, two cows actually, and wow. some pigs and chickens. At one corner, she has a space for hydroponics. She has a, a, a facility, a container that she's growing crops in in situ in water. And then the other aspect, uh, part of the plot, she's growing some uh, uh, crops. And even around her house, instead of having a floral bed, she has vegetables, you know, as as the bed the floral bed and she was telling us she came to to this program as a farmer not even as a doctor and in her presentation she gave us a breakdown of how much she's making from this plot of land mm. which has almost i mean all you know everything so she's um using the dung from the pigs to uh, as manure so she has a bit of organic uh, farming going on she's using uh, she she milks the cows and sell to the local community every morning she's using uh, the litter from the chickens you know um the the dung from the the animals as uh, to generate gas which she uses to cook and this is a modern farmer this is a woman and wow, on one project, plot on one plot she calls it the one acre uh, project and when she gave us a breakdown, she gave us a breakdown in dollars of how much she's making from this farm. And when she finished, with all the big speakers who came to speak at this World Food Prize, she got a standing ovation. We were all surprised at what she was doing. And so she was also encouraged. And um, the, the, the following year when I met her and I was speaking with her, she said that she's trying to um, transfer this concept, you know, to 
other youth who want to go into agriculture. I'm just saying that we need to let the youth understand that it's it's evolving. And if they want space and you know to find their space in agriculture, in production specifically, then they need to research into new ways of growing crops, you know, new ways of doing things. You may start small, like this lady who's growing strawberries in uh in Jowaloo. Um, it's not a very big unit, but she grows quality strawberries and she's supplying to major shops in 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 in, in um in Accra, you know, major supermarkets. Um, now, going into um, post-harvest or post-production, mm. there, there are huge opportunities. I mean, I love what is going on here in Ghana. A lot of pe people are venturing into that space, into food processing. Um, I, I, I dedicated my life as a food scientist to... Um, studying indigenous foods. I love indigenous Ghanaian foods. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the one of the most diverse, I think it was second on the list two years ago when it, in Africa, mm -hmm. with the most diverse foods. We have very nutritious foods. Uh, and so there's no reason why we should even be importing so much processed foods here into the country. Yeah. Unfortunately, we haven't found a very good way of processing what we have like if you talk about snacks i mean that uh i we grew up eating things like polo kati cake yeah um, uh, kuri, uh, you know kuri, kuri, oh, yeah <laughs> one of my favorites Aqua, um, look at those rich nutritious foods sure. but some way somehow Ghanaians feel that it is better to eat um pringles as a snack or some crackers or some um, heavily loaded food that you don't even know what is in there. They don't even put everything in there. You, we are importing uh, sweets from China. Mm. When we have condensed milk toffee, kube toffee, sure. when you talk about kube toffee, you have coconut, raw mm. coconut, you have coconut oil, you have a bit of sugar. Mm. What is healthier than, you know, than this? Yeah. I mean, if you compare a candy coming from China to Kube toffee, you and I know that Kube toffee is, is more authentic and nutritious. But dog, but dog, why is that? Why why are we doing that? When, when, like you said, we do have nutritious, you know, snacks, but we are now going into buying things from China and things from other countries and now consuming it as our, as our snacks instead of creating the ones that we have already. Yeah, the bottom line is creating value and finding a very good way of enhancing the quality, for, uh, prolonging the shelf life and having good quality products that can compete with these other products. So you realize that people are going into food processing, but they don't really have the expertise mm. or what it takes to make these products. Let me, let me really say this, put this out there. Cooking. Okay, just being good at cooking does not mean that you can produce a product that can last long. You need to have a bit of knowledge in the science of the, you know, understand the structure and all of that. You need to understand what it takes. When you add A to B, what do you get? How, yeah. how can you sustain that product? So it's a, there's a science around it. And that is where experts like myself come in. You know, we need to help people who want to venture into food uh, processing. We need to help them a be able to do that. Put mm. the signs out there, help them, give them guidance, you know, in order for them to do what they need to do. Because I found a lot of young people wanting to, I mean, they are doing it. Look at the products, you know, that are out there. Yeah. I have a, a, a lady that I'm working with. She's a mango farmer as well. They have a huge farm at Dodoa and they produce mango. So they were exporting a lot of the mangoes. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we've had issues about rejection of, uh, of mm -hmm. the mangoes that we send abroad because of insect infestation and all of that. And so there were times that they were having issues. They were not even able to sell them off to people who had contracted, you know, who had um, uh, uh, committed to actually buying the, the, the product once they were harvested. Yeah. So, you know, they were like, they were getting really, really a, a bit uh, fed up with the whole system and um they happened to talk to me um initially we just wanted to do some trial with the mangoes we wanted to go into drying of mangoes to see how well they can prolong the shelf life so mm -hmm. in case where 
people are not coming. You've harvested the mangoes. You don't just sit there and, and let the, the, the product go to waste. You can add value to the product. And so we did some trials for them. It was good. Um, dry technologies, if you're going to depend on electricity, may be a bit costly. So we're looking into um, using gas dryers for the dried mangoes. And, and so we did some trials. We're happy with the trials. Um, they went back and did a bit of research and they just came up with a recipe. Um, um, they made, uh, they call it, the people call it mango shito. So it's basically um, uh, a mango product that has some spices, onions, garlic, and, and pepper. And so you can use it as a marinade. You can use it as wow. a dip. And it's so the, the 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 brand is Handy Farms. I don't know if you've seen that product uh, on the market. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you've seen it, and they are winning awards. I mean, wow. the last one I know they won was for best packaging in Europe, and so now they have added value to the product. You understand? Wow. So they have diversified what they're doing, and they are they they they're taking advantage of the available technologies. They've registered the product. They are even they're making it from their kitchen. There, the FDA has certified what they're doing. So value addition is also very important if you want to venture into the space, not just the production. Find a way, even if you're producing, find a way to add value to what you're producing so that you're not left at the messy, you know, you're, you're not found wanting if you, you're not getting buyers or you're having issues. So yes, agriculture is very attractive. We should explore the use of technology convenient technologies, because in most of the works that I do, I use simple indigenous technologies. We need to expand and appreciate the products that we have. We have good products. We just need to take it to the next level. Mm. Okay. So, the, the, so what we call it product development, where you have a prop, you look at the food product uh, and find an appropriate way to produce, to store it and to package it so that it can last long. There's no need for us to be importing so much food. We do have a lot of processed foods and it's about time that the youth, if they want to go into agriculture, to also look at the space because it's also a very promising space. Thank you so much, Doc. I think that's very, very insightful. And I think one of the things as well is, you know, like you mentioned, are we actually patronizing these products as Ghanaians or are we still in that mindset of, you know, anything from outside is better than what we're producing here. Yeah, and and I, but I remember you asked me why why people tend to import these products. Mm. Because those countries where these foods have, are coming from have found a way of making it attractive. Yeah. They found a way of processing the product so it's shelf stable. They found a way of packaging it so it appeals to you. Most of the foods that we have, we haven't uh, done well at at preserving it to a very good quality. So it's like if you, you make fuller today, you know by tomorrow it's spoiled. There's mm -hmm. nothing you can do with it. Yeah. So there's no way you can put it out there on the shelf, hoping even export it, you know. So um, a lot of it has to do with finding the mm -hmm. appropriate signs, the appropriate technology to, to transform some of these foods that we have into a more stable form, a more attractive form. And a lot of uh, the young ones that I'm working with are doing it. These days, then, uh, if you agree, if you go to some shops, shops you see a lot of health products, yeah. you know, food products being developed in Ghana. You see a lot of uh, quite a number of cereals and snacks. Yeah. And, and you know, so um, it is promising, you know, and I feel that is where we could also invest a lot of, uh, um, I mean, people could could make some investment in so that we can become uh, we can become so you know Ghana can feed itself and we yeah, can even and save that two point four billion that goes out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to come on to um, um, Abuna Poku. She is somebody that's based in the UK um, and decided to go into pineapple farming. Um, I know Abuna has gone through highs and lows but has decided not to give up. And I want her to share her experience and why she decided, for somebody that's living in the UK, decided to invest in pineapple. Abana, welcome. Hi, Denta, how are you? I'm good, thank you, how are you? I'm okay, I'm trying to manage the working from home life, um, but yeah, going well so far. Fantastic, so tell us a bit about your day life and then tell us a bit about what you're currently doing when it comes to pineapple farming. 
Okay, so a bit of background about me. Um, I'm a marketing and business development professional. I work for a large international um, law firm and I'm the head of their Africa practice in terms of from a marketing and business development perspective. So I look at how the firm promotes itself in Africa, how we and um, the clients that we engage with, the clients we target, all of that sits under my remit. So my day job is essentially um, involves quite a bit of travel, but it's fundamentally about how we as an international firm really engage with the African continent. Um, and as a result of that, obviously, it means my exposure to contact business people, the mm. business environment is pretty extensive. And, and, you know, a lot of our engagement to date has, well, actually, we knew each other well before that, but yeah. more recently, we can um, engage on, on that level, which has been fantastic. Um, but, you know, the exposure has also really opened my eyes to the opportunities, and they are abundant. And, you know, it's been great hearing from the other commentators today who are obviously in the thick of it all in terms of um, farming and agriculture um, and I believe there's actually the same thing you know I see everything from banking and finance through to power infrastructure and all of those elements and I see the players in that in that space and the sad thing is that not many of them are African or black for that matter. Um, so where I'm coming from is a place where there is a real opportunity. I think agriculture is the unsung hero. I think with the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, it's going to open up an entire ecosystem of opportunities within the um, agricultural space. And I want to be a part of that. So um, and with all of this rhetoric, to be fair, I, I, I actually say I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm sort of an accidental farmer. Um, because um, a couple of years ago, as everyone does, I was weeping from not having invested in um, Bellagio when it first came out and um, Chisaco Valley and was thinking, how can I make my next investment in Ghana and make it a real success? So obviously land is the easy thing to do in most countries. And because I'm not living in Ghana, I wanted something that could accumulate while I was uh, while I was living here. So I bought a piece of land in true Ghana form, it didn't go to plan, um, had lots of contention about the land and ended up moving that land to another location to a different site, which is um, in a place called Brekusu, which is actually not far from where Assessor University is right now. Okay. So um, the site they gave me, I bought three and a half acres, um, nice piece of land overlooking Accra, just beautiful. Um, but knowing how hard it was to even get that land, I wanted to secure it. The cost of securing it using normal traditional methods, i.e. building a wall, was going to cost me about the same amount of money as actually buying the land would have cost me. I thought, that can't be right. So I was like, I started looking around and seeing what my other options were. And I noticed on the way to the site, there were literally my neighbours to my left and my right were all farming pineapple. So I thought, huh, well, actually, as a measure to protect the land why, and, and a way to actually generate some revenue as well, why don't I farm on it? And, um, and, and actually, that becomes, hopefully, uh, you know, people will know that the land is being used. So mm-hmm. I actually only got into it to protect my land. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, fast forward a couple of years, um, uh, and I must say, you know, at first it was like, oh, it must be easy. You know, we had a couple of people um, kind of tell us what to do, and we used some of the local farmers as well who were, uh, you know, <laughs> let's just say they weren't using the best practices. Um, and the first tranche didn't go well. Um, now, what's really interesting about that particular fruit um, is that pineapple has a very good exit market in, in Ghana. So I think whenever you're looking for any type of investment, um, you know, whether it's stocks and shares or whether it's, you know, real estate, you're always looking for how you can exit and making sure that you can secure your investment. Um, and I had not actually appreciated the range of exits there are in the local market. So you don't, you know, you don't even have to go outside of your own borders. There are buyers of pineapple and of many vegetables in Ghana. Um, some of them are producing, some of them are doing packaging, some of them are manufacturing, some of them are, you know, repurposing and then selling, um, selling on to international markets. So when I actually went through the first tranche, um, of what was left <laughs> from a very bad effort, um, I was actually able to select the local market. And, you know, really do not underestimate these market women when you go to Mokola and you see them. These guys, they know what it's about. That's where the real money is in Ghana. Um, (laughs) And, you know, they can buy large quantities at any one time. So I was actually able to get rid of of the pineapples relatively quickly. And I thought, okay, I didn't make any money, 
um, I didn't lose large amounts of money because it's not particularly invest um, particularly expensive. I could have, you know, bought a pair of um, designer shoes and spent more money, to be honest. Um, so I thought, okay, well, let's see what if we can do this again. But this time I thought this hasn't been done properly, so I'm going to step it up a game um, at um, a level and see what I can do if I actually really put some money behind this. So the guys who were doing it, who were on the sort of the farms around. Now, you know, let me let me let me not cut you. But how much did you invest the first time? Like you know, for somebody that's looking to do this, maybe pineapple farming or whatever it is, how much did you invest your first trench? I mean, it couldn't have been more than about nine hundred to a thousand pounds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's. I mean, and obviously everybody's levels of investment is different, but you know, I know people that. I mean, a decent designer bag will take you back two and a half grand. So you know what I mean. So, but and that's kind of how I was looking at it. I was like, how else would I spend this money? You know, going out to dinner, however many times in a in a in a month. You know, you'll spend a, a reasonable amount of money. So rather than do that, why not invest it in something that can hopefully, you know, um, give you some income. So the next tranche, I thought, OK, well, you know, and at the time as well, I had a bit of money to invest. And I thought, well, let's let's see what else I can do if I if I went did it properly. So I got in touch with the local farmers, did my due diligence. Oh, so I thought um, and, um, you know, these guys have been doing it for many years. The father is actually um, a teacher in one of the universities in Ghana, I think, in tech um, on agriculture. He's been doing it for 25 years. So seriously experienced. Um, and, and they obviously focus solely on pineapple as well. So I thought, OK, well, these guys know what they're doing. The benefit as well is that they had the land. So. Um, I didn't have to go out and buy land or find, you know, someone to lease it then to have issues around whether or not the land was secured or not. That was already that was a, an issue I didn't have to worry about. So we agreed that because it was the first effort that I'd pay him a small fee uh, for him to manage the farm for me. But I would pay up front the cost of what it would cost to actually do the farm. And farming comes with lots of upfront costs. You know, you've got to till the land, you've got to prepare it, you know, um, especially if it's virgin land, which is actually what you you want for certain vegetables you've got to um that means cutting down trees you know really kind of going through quite a bit of effort if you like to make sure that the land is has got good soil and is ready for producing so we did that went through the process uh, made the investment um sadly well, how, much, how much investment did you then put in so um for the second round i'd say it was about 12 grand um 12 grand twelve thousand um, pounds wow. give or take but I did five acres, so that's a hundred thousand pineapples. And actually, wow. as I'm learning, it could have been maybe 150,000 pineapples. But you know, it was a good, decent amount. And had it gone well, to be mm. honest, mm. I would have for a 13 grand investment, I would have made up, you know, on the upside of 40 to 50,000 um, if it had been successful and they had grown at the size we wanted. And I'd have been able to export them or sell them to um, certain suppliers in Ghana, then it would have been a very fruitful investment. Sadly, obviously, you know, with most agricultural um, produce, it's very much to the mercy of the heavens <laughs> and to nature. And unfortunately, you know, rains and all sorts of other issues came and it wasn't as fruitful as we would wanted. But, um, you know, I've come to an agreement with the guy who was doing my farming for me so that at least I don't lose out on my initial investment. Uh -huh. And moreover, the way pineapple works is that it's a very, it's a, it's a massive multiplier. So for every one sucker that you buy, um, that sucker will, will bear you a, a flower, which is what you'll see as the pineapple. Then when that flower comes out, the sucker or the mother sucker, if you like, that sounds quite funny, isn't it? Mother sucker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it basically reproduces more suckers. So for that okay. one pineapple, you can get three or four times that, um, you know, the, oh. the original mother. Exactly. So it means that you can go from... You can go from, um, so like I started with two um, two acres, went from two acres to five acres, five acres to 20 acres, and it can multiply um, quite quickly. So within 10 years, you could be looking on a, a couple of hectares sites worth of pineapple with 30% um, 30, 30 of the cost, which is the cost of buying the sucker itself. Actually, you won't even need to buy that because you'll be producing it for yourself. And, you know, you can manage how you produce it. You can manage the, you know, the um, quality of it. So there are loads of benefits to that. And so once you start, it's very difficult to give up because you've got the suckers. Mm. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. You know, although the first tranche didn't go well, um, we've agreed that I would get my initial investment back and the suckers. So I'm actually reapplying that to a new site. 
um, and I'm hoping to go from five acres to 20 quite quickly. Wow. So yeah. the new site, is it the same type of area or a different? No, it's a slightly further out of Accra. So this, um, the original site was in Nisuam, which obviously mm -hmm. is quite known for its pineapple. Um, but, you know, at the moment, and I really liked what uh, Mavis was saying about, you know, really kind of when you're doing these kinds of projects, thinking not just what's been done before, but actually what's the gold standard? How can we replicate what other countries are doing and being successful at, um, you know, what are the conditions that we need, you know, the fertilizer, all the rest of it, and really thinking a bit more broad-minded about how we can get the best product out of the resources that we have. So um, this particular site is slightly further out, but what we're looking to do, and I'm, I'm actually joined up with um, a co-farmer, also a diasporan who okay. happens to work on yeah, <laughs> happens to work for a large um, aircraft manufacturer um, who has moved back to Ghana and, you know, he's doing great things with it. And he's actually gone into manufacturing juice. And actually our plan um, or, you know, the plan that he has and I have is to look at creating a brand. So going back to what Mavis said about the value add and mm. why, why can't we be the Tropicana of the world? You know, why yeah. can't we have the brand that people look at and say, yeah, that's what Africa is about without having palm trees and all sorts of other, you know, I, iconic images that, that actually don't necessarily sum us up. So what we, what I would like to do. Um, and also there's a comment that one of your commentators, I think on the last one made about, you know, farmers, you've been asking it quite a lot about, you know, is farming for everyone? How can we mm. engage? and there is definitely something i think that can be done on the branding of farming okay um, i think that brand farm is not necessarily a sexy or attractive one if you were to say that you know why don't you go into private equity or finance and everyone gets excited but you know the thought of being a farmer doesn't fill anybody with great joy and i think that that's something that that needs to be changed you know farming is very very interesting the the learning you can get from it the potential that you can get from it and the opportunity is insurmountable and i would love to see that brand farming changed and transformed and if i'm the one or you know my my um you know other diasporans are the ones to kind of lead that charge then i'm up for it and would you would you be open to other diasporans that maybe want to partner with you or you know get involved in what you're doing to scale it up even bigger is it something that you would be open to like you and Kwame 100% I mean Kwame also he's actually already set up and we should definitely get him on the show if you do it again but he's actually set up a, um, a crowdfunding platform for agriculture so if okay. somebody wants to actually invest in agriculture and they're in the diaspora, whether you've got five hundred pounds or five thousand pounds or fifty thousand pounds, and you want to make an investment into a farm, that platform gives you and it tracks the progress of the different types okay. of agricultural, you know, investment that you've made. So you can actually see it and feel some comfort in knowing, okay, it's going well or it's not going well, and this and this is why. Um, and actually, he's really got he's really working on that and. They apparently they've won some they've really got some um, awards to go through some accelerated programs so hopefully that will be coming out soon but you know it's it's that it's i'd love to partner with anyone who um has an interest i definitely need to speak to mavis about the um the science of it because that's oh. another key ingredient that's missing and particularly when we're looking at exporting to international markets or adding value and creating brands um the science has to be there and it has to be on point so i'll be in touch with you mavis after this show but yes, Dentar, you know, for anyone that's interested, contact me. Definitely. But before before you go off, I just want to say, like, I know we had a conversation last week and you're like, I'm giving up, I'm giving up, I'm fed up. <laughs> <laughs> These people, they just don't know what are, no, let's be real to the people. Like, what are the some of the challenges, the real challenges that you face when it comes to farming and working with people that you don't know, you're not there to oversee it. How is that? I think, I mean, and you know, everybody has a slightly different risk appetite. Let's, let's, let's start there. Um, you know, if I was investing in a stock and that stock 
died you know it was it, I lost all my money I would be like nah, okay what's well, the stock market I kind of knew that when I was getting into it so you don't have you have the expectation that you could either win big or lose big right but with farming and with it being Ghana it's like your home there's an expectation that if you make if you put the money in then you should absolutely get something out mm. but it is also a business and unfortunately it is a it's not a necessarily something that is a um that you can predict what's going to happen you hope for the best um, but, you know, nature does what it wants to do when it wants to do it. Who could have, you know, um, predicted the locusts coming in and wiping out small, you know, loads of um, lots of acres of, of agriculture? You know, you can't predict that kind of um, situation. So for me, my my biggest challenge was trust because brand okay. Ghana isn't great from a diaspora perspective, whether or not you're buying land, investing in um, agriculture or, or or anything else, you know that there's always a risk that you might get conned. Mm. And I think that that, it was, for me, was a, was a huge risk and a, a great concern. So with having that apprehension already and then things not going well, my initial assumption and my immediate assumption was this guy's, you know, he's tried to rip me off and he's this and I need to sort him out. And this is what happens when you're in the diaspora and you're, you're a woman and you're trying to invest and people take advantage of you. Um, so, you know, you have all of these um, these thoughts in your head, um, but fundamentally you're, you're, you're in a business and businesses don't always succeed, um, you know, and they don't always turn around a profit in, in two years. Um, most businesses, as we know, take five years for you to even break even. So I think if you're going to go into it, you need to go into it with your eyes open and go into it with the view that this is an investment um, that you do your best to make sure that it goes well, but be prepared for if it doesn't go well and what's your backup plan. And you know, you know, be in it for the long run. Um, be in it for the long road. Is agriculture profitable? It can be. Um, I think that it does take time. I don't think it's. A, I'm going to invest one year and make my money back. I think it is a good five year investment before you even start to see the fruits um, or the benefits. Sorry for the pun. Um, but the, I think, I think absolutely, and I think the real, the real money comes in manufacturing in production that's where the real money comes in okay and then you haven't spoken about i know you took you spoke about you know then the, the twelve thousand. what did the twelve thousand actually go into did you have to buy tractors what did you have to get what did you have to use i mean twelve thousand pounds is a lot of money what were you using that twelve thousand pounds for so that would have covered, for example, um, as I mentioned before, you have to prepare the land. And because the land we were using was virgin land, it, it meant that we needed to prepare the land. People that don't know, is it irrigation? What, what is it? So no, virgin land is essentially, if you look at a forest, a forest has virgin land because you can see the trees, the foliage, it's like, it's not been touched. So virgin land is, is, is land that hasn't essentially been farmed on for some time. Um, and in this particular scenario, the land that we were using was that. So there were huge trees on the land, you know, loads of foliage. Um, you know, it was it was a wild area. So we needed to basically get that land down. And remember that it was five acres, so it's not a particularly small site. Um, so to get, you had to get a tractor in to kind of, you know, um, grade the land. Then you've got to, um, you know, furrow the land. You need to get the lines in so that you can prepare for the pineapples. Um, then you actually need, we used, um, um, what we'll call it like a black um, melsh. So you need to lay the melsh. Then you've got to pay the, um, the farmers, the workers as well. Um, I mean, that covered everything though. So throughout the duration, and, and pineapples are about 14, 15 months, um, you know, um, um, they take about 14, 15 months before you can harvest them. Okay. So, you know, paying the workers, the fertilizers, the pesticides, the mm. entire process, that's what that covered. And even I think um, to some extent, um, I think that also included the cost of um, hiring the the trucks to take the pineapples to the market or to our um, our local buyers as well at the end. So to be fair, I think for what you, what I paid, it, it was it was relatively reasonable. But like I say, everyone has their own risk appetite. Um, it's just unfortunate that it wasn't as successful as I'd hoped. But like um, I explained to you, Denta, um, it's going to take more than that to stop me um, from pursuing this because I really do believe in it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Abner. Don't go away. I'm going to put you down, but I'm going to bring you back up because I, I can see that now people are firing you questions oh my God. So, <laughs> and they want to know more. So I'm going to bring you down, but I'm going to speak to you more later.
So I'm going to bring back Fertis. So Fertis, is agriculture profitable? You know, and how long will it take? Some, because some people are just like, you know, they think that it will take like six months and then you can get some money out. You know, how long, what's the mindset that people have to be in um, when they are going into agriculture? Um, okay. Um, the mindset, uh, it, this is a long-term play. This isn't a short play. This isn't the stock market. So, um, you know, if, if some people want to play in certain areas, great. If you just want to play in post-production, uh, if you want to play in just in packaging, if you don't want to, if you want to add value, fantastic. Um, that's, that's where, uh, you might say that the turnaround is a, a perhaps a much quicker. I've developed a lot of products over the years, not only food, but also beverage. I've done juices. I've done alcoholic beverages. I've done ice cream. I've done sauces. I've done nuts. Wow. I've done all sorts of products. I don't really go into all of that because I'm solving structural issues right now. Um, and fish was probably one of my biggest. Uh, moving lobster, moving a whole host of, and prawns as well, mm -hmm. from Southern Africa and from Mozambique. Okay. Now, um, it's not a short-term thing, uh, by no imagination. Um, and like, like was cited several times, there's several aspects to the value chain you can pick to uh, see your rewards. And if you put your efforts in, you can be successful. Now, I want to just take a step back, then to just for a second, because mm -hmm. there are some practical issues. I don't want to go too big. I know many people are just looking at how to start out, and that was the notion of how you uh, pitch for this particular show. Mm -hmm. So I got a question from a friend of mine that said, listen, I got $5,000. Tell me what I can do. Yes. Well, first of all, your commitment has to be there, all right? Mm -hmm for what you need to investigate to know your market, as Dave is also cited, right? But there's several areas. Now, for instance, mushrooms doesn't take long to grow. Do you want to go into mushrooms? You want to go into specialty mushrooms? It's, it's a pretty straightforward, easygoing business. I'm heavily involved in aquaponics. Uh, this is an area that produces organically and without uh, herbicides, fungicides, any of that. So, uh, that business is tremendous, and you can start very small and grow it and compartmentalize. You see, that's the beauty of aquaponics. Um, and there are certain systems that will enable you to do that. So um, it's an area that I think is a high-growth area, uh, a natural um, area, and, um, and it's the integration, uh, for those that don't know, of uh, horticulture and fish production. Or and what and it can I can cover fruit I can cover vegetables and fish production, um, so you can grow perennials you can grow annuals as well in different types of beds. So these are the types of wonderful things that you can do. Uh, again, the returns are not immediate. Uh, you have to put together your financial model. You have to put together business uh, standard business um, knowledge applies in developing this. So. You know, you, you have to put together your systems to understand your, your clearly your break-even point, everything else, and all the other ratios to know what you're doing. So the short answer to your question, uh, no, it's not an immediate situation like that. If you want to go to just normal uh, growing uh, systems and, and just go to uh, standardized farming, as uh, the woman spoke earlier about, yes, mm -hmm. the return on investment you have to be willing to plan. You, you're going to learn some lessons, valuable lessons too, about what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a that's a critical aspect. I specialize in how to extract value uh, in shorter time frames as well. So I, I look at this very seriously. And um, so anyway, I'll, I'll just leave it there. No. Uh, so for, how do you, how you know when you talk about value? So for instance, if somebody wants to go into uh, into pineapple, what other values can be added? to make it successful? Well, <laughs> you know, it, she mentioned juice, but you know, I, I, you know, for instance, I've developed juice and tea infusions. Um, I think it's a big market. I think it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, uh, also pulping. The fact that uh, pulping is, is sold around the world, putting 220 aseptic liter drugs and sent around the world um, 
um, that that business is tremendous for for blends, for mixes, for all sorts of things. Passion fruit is another one that can you know if you want to uh, just to change the pitch from pineapple. Uh, passion fruit is up there with orange juice. So um, so this is a these are some incredibly uh, great opportunities. Absolutely, I'm gonna but go. It's limited. You know, you got dried fruit, you got juice. Mm. You know, mm. it's limited. Yeah. Um, Coconut has a longer value chain. Okay. Okay. All right. Davis, I mean, you've been farming for many years, started, you know, um, quite young and won numerous amount of awards. Now, it must be very successful for you. You must have been very successful in what you are doing. Mm -hmm. is, is profitable is it profitable that's what people want to know people want to know that if i invest my money am i going to get my money back or even you know earn more than what i invested yes agriculture is profitable and it depends on like i i said and i keep saying how you do it uh, because if you really want to do uh, be profitable in it then you need to take it as a business because i know people who say look I just want to invest, and uh, as to what sort of investment it is, uh, I, I, I don't know because uh, may, maybe the person has. Uh, and time was somebody mentioned some figures because if, if you are going to invest maybe a thousand or two thousand Ghana into agriculture, then you you need to look at which part of the value chain you, you want to do that. For me, I, I would rather ask you to go and buy something. And go and sell. I mean, in, within the value chain, you can also go buy some bags of uh, how do you call it, uh, maize, and maybe retail to somebody else. That gives you money. But if you really want to work on the value chain, like what I do, mm. like where I till the soil and also export, mm. that is profitable. But it depends on how you also do it. Because, for instance, uh, our production cost is a bit high. Okay. Uh, if you compare our production cost is a very high, a bit high because of the way we approach our things because most of our things are not mechanized now, like i said most of your capital goes into things that are said to be public goods than you investing uh about 80 percent of the money into the sector so if you do that then it becomes a problem to start with and again if you move into distance i, I wouldn't want you to expect a break uh, in through or maybe a break even within six months. Uh, it depends on what you do. Again, uh, I think that you look at a year and over where you start making uh, profit because uh, we are not being competitive because one of our, 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 our production costs. Because if you look at somebody like me who uh, produce mango and export mangoes, uh, we have a lot of charges from the, the farm itself where uh, labor becomes very intensive and very high uh, through to the port where you have, uh, when you go to the port, the, the now coffees, whatever charges and the whole lot which are not being waived. So uh, if a mango is supposed to sell for $1.40, you end up selling for $1, somebody selling for $1, you end up selling for $1. 40 cents. The good news is because our, our mango taste in the whole world is the best, uh, take it or leave it, they, they, they want to have mangoes from you to sell what they bring from other countries. And these are some of the things. Pineapple, the same thing. I know of the pineapple where they even rose to get the, the what you call the Sankofa brand. And all of a sudden, the, the MD2 became an issue where the soccer, uh, or most of their soccer started getting disease. So they are not getting the, the weight. And, and again, I think that the duty bearers should wake up. Because if you look at the most of the inputs we use, uh, most of 60, 40 to 60 percent of the inputs are adulterated. You don't know it comes from China. But then it, all this will come through our ports. Mm. You have the EPA, you have the Santa Board Authority and go working there. I don't know how most of these chemicals also penetrate to the market. So if you do that and maybe you're supposed to use uh, uh, 10 mils of chemical to do something, you end up using over a liter and all this uh, at your cost. So mm. once that happens, it, it blows you into out of proportion and becomes a, a, a problem. And one other thing I think we should also look at is, and you mentioned it right, if we all change our mindset to maybe start 
uh, consuming what you produce here. That will give us some, some mileage to be able to make a lot of profit. But if we use Ghana as a dumping ground for uh, produce from Europe, the China, and the, the, the United States, where their subsidy rates are very, very high. Most of these inputs that uh, come into our countries are well subsidized. As against the ordinary farmer here who is also trying to make a living or take it to another level. Uh, and so it doesn't make you competitive. So yes, it is very profitable, but it depends on how you do it. But then, like I said, we, we need to look, you need to take advantage of all the system whatever in the system first and foremost you need to be able to know uh, the policies the regulations and other things and then take advantage you need to get to the agri offices the ministry of trade the, the standard board authorities everywhere that you can have you can take advantage of to be able to uh, make sure that you you you, you cut some uh, how do you call it, some of your expenses it's very important to do because if you don't do that it becomes a problem if you look at our production sector too i think we highly rely on a rain fed. So we are doing rain fed agriculture instead of irrigation. Meanwhile, we have all the, we, we have water. Mm -hmm. Indiana, we have the weather. So we, we, we could cash into the window. For instance, we do button and squash. And when uh, the Euro European countries are out of season, the window, that's where we cash into it. So you sell premium. Mm -hmm. You sell premium. But all these things, you need the irrigation to do it. If you go to, again, Brazil and most of these countries, they, they send water to the doorsteps of the farmers for us to be able to tap. But here you need to do it solely on your own. It becomes a problem. And believe you me, water beneath is better than water from above because water beneath you can easily control. Mm. You can easily control and make sure that look, your, your pests, and uh, they call it calamity pests, all these things, you are able to control them on time. Now, because if you, you spray or you apply an insecticide and it rains, Obviously, you need to go back to do another. But then if it is water that you are regulating, you know when to apply all these things on time. So it reduces your production cost. One other thing I also want to mention is, you see, mechanization is very important. Until we, we, we try to mechanize about 70% of the system, agriculture, a lot of people will still be complaining that it's not profitable. Yeah, because for me, if people talk about mechanization, they only look at the uh, tractor, the plow, the harrow, and other. It's a whole value, value chain issue where you have people sitting producing, uh, others are also uh, using other technology, like maybe rightly said, uh, what prevents people to go into greenhouses, what prevents people to also add in value, where are they going to packaging, branding, and that. I'm quick to also say that I think I've seen when you go to our shelves, our packaging and branding, we have been. Mm. Move a bit. Yeah. So that gives you that gives us one advantage over uh, most of the things. If you look at what happened in December, where uh, some of us uh, decided to take rice to another level, mm. and, and uh, I, I spoke every national farmers day. Myself, the president, I've been doing this for almost six years. Myself, the president, and great minister, we speak. I speak in for for on behalf of the agri business community, and I said, like, look, we 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 should. Look at that industry well, where uh, I want uh, president, I mean, to direct all MMDCs to buy the made in Ghana rice. And thank God, president responded and said, Look, uh, when he was sitting coming for, for the past week, uh, the, the order from his house, from Madame, the number one lady in the country, says, Look, nobody is eating uh, imported rice in their house, and, and, and it's full stop. The other summer. And that year, I mean, this summer, as everybody, rice, the imported rice became so scarce that the, the, the local rice became so scarce to the extent that people were rebagging imported rice in local bags to sell. But again, look at the production cost because if I'm selling uh, a local rice, uh, 25 kilo for 160 Ghana cities, as against the, the imported one, of 50 kilos or maybe 250. Somebody will go for the imported one. And again, that's a production yeah. cost. We need to look at a simple, simple equipment that will uh, enhance production to reduce the cost. In that case, we will become competitive. But until we do that, a grid will never be attractive. But I tell you what, it is very profitable. It depends on how you do it. And I will encourage that we should be able to have it done right 
and uh, uh, the production people should be there. Those who want to take uh, add value to it, and thank God the food scientists are around. So, so what prevents government engaging them to say, hey, "Youth, we, we want to move about every year 500 youth into that where we engage them to be able to teach them the right and the right source of uh, how do you call it uh, packaging, the right source of uh, adding value, the right source in the next." Uh, 10, 5, 10 years will change the whole dynamics. Do you understand? And once we change it, uh, it becomes another ball game because we've been talking about Ghana beyond eight. And I think that Agri becomes a game changer. So we need to do it right because we have water, we have weather, we have the, 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 the human resource, we, we, we also have the, the, the land, everything to our advantage to be able to make it work and use Ghana as a production hub for, for the entire country of the world. Absolutely. Doc, what do you have to add on to what um, Davis has said? Yeah, um, I would, I mean, they all make very important points. And the bottom line is it could, it is profitable, you know. And uh, from where I sit, especially engaging food processes, um, when people come to me, you know, um, I have this idea, or uh, sometimes they come and they don't have anything, you know, they don't know what they, they just want to process. I want to do something. Mm. And um, I, I keep telling them, you don't need so much money to start when it comes to food processing. And that is the truth. I have worked with a candy, um, uh, how, how do I put it? Maybe an entrepreneur who sold um, uh, uh, condensed milk toffee on the street. You know, and um, she she was uh, she was making forty Ghana CDs a day, uh, with two tins of condensed milk. Uh, I saw her on the street. I bought her product. Um, I loved it. That was years ago, I hadn't seen um, uh, condensed milk toffee packed, you know, uh, like that before because I make it myself and I really burn my my hands, my palms when I'm even molding the candy. So when I saw it, uh, you know, saw her selling it on the street. I was so impressed and I bought one. I took it to the, my office, I ate, and um, people were like, okay, I want some. I put it up on Facebook and people were requesting from all over, I mean, from America and the and UK, send me a piece, send me that. So I brought her into the lab and I realized, of course, she makes the candy every day because obviously, you know, when she makes it, um, and it, it doesn't, uh, she doesn't finish selling it. By the next day, it goes a little soft. It loses its gumminess. Mm. So we brought her to the lab. And we did a few trials. We added some ingredients. We did a one with a con nutmeg. We did a lemon. We grated the, the, the rind of lemon. We, 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 we spiced it up a little bit. And we did some sensory mm -hmm. analysis with the students at the University of Ghana Food Science Department. And I said, OK, go do this. And so she started and from request on Facebook. Uh, people came to help her get a certificate, uh, AMA certificate. I, I got help from a couple of friends. In the end, she had to move to headquarters and she was making this and making, the last time I saw her, then I couldn't make her out. She makes 450 Ghana cities a day and she wow. no longer sells on the street. So wow. she makes it and people come and buy it off her and sell. So when I say that you can start with any small amount, with mm. food, I it. I've worked with people who, um, you know, someone came to me, she was like, I want to make cornflakes. You know, I, I read about you. Um, I, I just want to, to process conflict. She gave me a beautiful story about, you know, the waste in the maize value chain and all of that. And I just put a simple question across to her. Um, have you seen any made in Ghana conflicts on the market? She said, no. I said, why do you think it's so? It's not that we can't make it, but I was very honest with her that the technology required to do that is quite expensive. You needed a drum dryer on extrusion and it requires a lot of electricity, you know, um, energy. And so, of course, subsidies, other countries have subsidies, so they'll make it cheaper and, and you know, low grade, of course, and then they bring to Ghana for us to buy. So it's a quite expensive. I told her, you know what, because you want, you don't have that much money, you really want to start small, go and think about something else. And she came back and said, okay, I'm thinking about yam. What can I make of yam? And I told her, we can make yam chips like French fries. Mm. So we did a, a consumer survey, and because she is starting small, she doesn't have the blast visa and all of that. You know, I look at what you what you can afford. We she did it to tell tell. She sent a survey and we analyzed the data and they were interested. So in the end, we I gave her some training on how to make yam chips and she's supplying to 
hotels now, you know, hotels and some restaurants. So she makes it, freezes it in the bags and send, you know, sell to them. So the point I'm trying to make is we need, there's a lot that could be done in that space if we really want to engage the youth in agriculture. There is this huge opportunity when it comes to food processing and it could be anything. You may not have any idea at all. You may have something, you may have a family recipe. It may be something that you thought about that you think is very novel. You need people to help. You need people who are in the, the space. If you go to food research, we have food scientists at food research. At my institute at Ghana Atomic Energy, University of Ghana, there are so many people that you can speak to. I mean, experts who can help. And that is what is missing. Mm. You know, I think it's the education and the knowledge. It is the missing link. And I am advocating. I am engaging key stakeholders, especially the government. There is the need to have some processing centers across the country. You know, when I say processing centers, I'm not looking at the huge uh, factories that have, have, have been run down that cannot even be operated. I'm talking about having facilities with basic equipment like dryers, mills, you know, equipment that people who within a locality, for instance, you're in a maize growing uh, area and there is a, a uh, you have a facility that has some equipment, you know, that have been set up that you can pay a small fee to access and you can manage to process the maize into, for instance, um, uh, uh, how do we call it? Equegbemi uh, uh, or we have, you know, Oblayo, you know, just adding value. But you need these uh, equipment, which you as an entrepreneur may not be able to afford. Yeah. The private sector could also come in to offer these kinds of equipment for a service uh, fee. We could have um, setups where they're run by the community to empower the community to process certain foods that are, uh, are, are readily um, grown in those communities. And we need to have incubation facilities because mm. there's a growing population of youth who want to venture into food processing space. I agree that one district, one factory, but I was asking, so in Accra, what one uh, factory would you build in, in districts in Accra? What, what, what one factory? But you could have a model facility which has uh, um, indigenous traditional technologies as, as well as uh, sophisticated technologies that could be made available. So somebody wants to make, for instance, um, Tom Brown and all, you know, other, 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 other cereal products. They, she cannot buy a mail. She cannot buy a dryer. She, you know, they can access these facilities like we do. I have a, I have worked in an incubation center whilst doing my research at LSU, and you have the local these facilities, other university, food science department, where locals come in, incubate. They can make their products, and then, you know, sometimes they even have storage facilities for them, and then they can sell off, you know, or store at these facilities. That is the way to go because a lot of people want to do this a lot of youth now that there are no jobs uh, uh, a lady came to me she wants to make sausages okay but she first of all wants to raise her pigs of course land is a challenge so th th that that's an issue for her but she also would prefer also want to buy meat from farmers and come she has she had her own recipe very tasty product when, when i tasted them she making um and using healthy spices no um, artificial additives. Mm. She buys the meat and makes her own, um, you know, the burger, the meat that we use for burgers. Yeah. yeah. And she started with a very small amount. But in the case where she needs um, technologies like grinders and, 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 and you know, certain uh, uh, equipment that she may not be able to afford, if we're serious about empowering the youth, to go into agriculture, which includes food processing, we should make it easy for them to have some access to some of these facilities, as well as have, have uh, be able to incubate them and give them the necessary skills, the necessary advice, and the required expertise that they can, you know, uh, um, grow in, in in the kind of businesses that they want to pursue. Thank you. Oh, so much insight. Honestly, it's just been absolutely amazing. But I want to go back to Davis. You know, from when you started to where you are now, what would you have done differently from when you first started to now and with the knowledge that you know now? 
Yeah, I think I would have contacted the agri offices before starting anything for advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, uh, uh, because simply because, like I said, uh, look at me uh, establishing the 400 acre plantation in Sumenya, uh, where the mm -hmm. rainfall pattern is very erratic. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, for for trees, they demand rain. So I should have done. Maybe if I even went to Bunsu, Begro, and that, and that would also be one of the best uh, time for me. And uh, so, but then because I didn't go through the Ministry of Agri, uh, you rightly and maybe rightly said it. You, you you come with your own ideas, but you don't have ideas because that's what. Because you have money, you said, look, this I want to farm. This is what I want to do because everybody's doing. Uh, I've seen tea, tea plantation foreigners establishing a huge tea plantation in so many areas. And I checked the the whole, I did the economics analysis and I said, look, it, it is very good. So I want to just embark. And the, in the initial of me going through the right channel for them to tell me, no, you can do it at this way, at this place, instead of this, I decided to go into, to do that in so many. So if you ask me, yes, the first thing I would have done is to go to the Ministry of Agric and talk to them. The other thing also to register with almost all the agencies. Uh, okay. The Lights of Ghana for Promotion Authority, uh, okay. where from the one you start getting some sort of uh, knowledge. Because uh, currently, you know, we, 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 all of us are hailing uh, Africa continental free trade coming to Ghana. But the thing is, do we have the, the necessary skills to be able to compete? Uh, if we talk about agriculture, to be able to, our people, our labor, do we have the, the skill set to be able, for them to be able to, take advantage with all these businesses coming because of course you get people who want to invest into farming and other do we have those skill sets to be able to deploy them and this is where i think that uh, as a country we should be able to harness certain opportunities uh, like we have all the people around to be able to educate others to take advantage so if you ask me yes the first thing i would have done differently was to contact the duty bearers for them to show me the way Okay. Okay. So go to, so I want you to list the, the, the kind of the process in which you should yeah. go. So tell me the process. Yeah. So the process is simple. For instance, yeah. if you want to start farming, mm -hmm. uh, you don't just go buy land. You need to uh, uh, do a lot of background check on the land else you need, you, you lose your money because okay. uh, so you need to go do the search and that one before you pay. Uh, but the first thing you have to do is to contact the Greek Essential offices to find out whether what you want to do uh, is feasible in the area. Uh, you know, because the whole country is zoned to what uh, does well where. So you need to find out. Once you do that, you should be able to also get to the lands department to check. Uh, after which time, you also need to uh, check whatever you are going to do and align to the very agencies to go and register. But let me tell you about something about land. I think. The, I would say that the urban land methodology should be different from the rural, simply because, for instance, if I want to go into farming and uh, I'm going to buy land, the amount of money I'm going to use to process the land and the time, mm. you, you have no idea. But wow. if I want to sell it, then it means, so, so if we're still going to use the... Oh, this the is love. Land, it's like you, you've experienced it, you know? <laughs> no, it's, it's just, true. It, it becomes a problem. Okay. You understand? So this is, and I've said it over and over and over. And I was happy that uh, the lab uh, project came, the lab one, lab two, but they couldn't complete it. Mm -hmm. We're still in the same soup where people are being duped. But uh, because the thing is, you can't buy land and say you are not going to cultivate. Mm -hmm. but, but you need to do a background check. And if you're not doing that, the land becomes yours when you register. When you register. And your, your documents will go to lands commission for two years. Do you understand mm -hmm. me? Oh. Where they, tell you they have other backlogs to clear and all of these are some but it could be done pretty easier if the methodology is different. Yeah. If the urban land methodology is different than rural, it casts it, it, it gives you a clean shape as to how you have to register it and, and get your things done. So, so I think these are some of the things I also recommend that government look at. And it, it's like they should have done that like yesterday, else because if they don't do it, it becomes a 
a big problem. We won't get people. But David, in. you are in front of the president every year. I, I, I say that every every day. <laughs> <laughs> most, <laughs> most, most of the things I say, all the past presidents, we go, we engage them, they change things. But you see, I'm one of the few people who do want to blame politicians for most of the things. Okay. That's because they will give instructions. But if they give instructions, the people sitting there, are they doing it? You see, this is so that because so if we, we, are, if we are, now go yeah. under the politicians, it becomes a, a, a problematic for me. Mm. You understand me? We engage. For instance, last week we tried to engage with GEPA, the presidency. And as we speak today, there is a letter to civil aviation that we can bring our own flight to, to airlift our things. 25 years. Mm. We've been complaining about it for 25 years. But today, here we are. We, we've been complaining about interest rate. Now there is Gessel. But what we are saying is there should be a single digit interest rate. So there should be a special purpose vehicle created within the banks. We don't need any new bank to do that, to channel that. Because once Gessel is, re Gessel is ready to mitigate 70% of the risk, then means the interest rate should go down. I don't see why the interest rate is still double digit and as far as 28%, 29%. If you understand me. And if we should also compare some of the bank, they should give them some incentives for them to be able to own land to, to, to agriculture, to us agriculture, not own land to only somebody who is buying input, own land to somebody who is rather bringing uh, something to compete. I mean, importing chicken, importing rice and other things, that won't help. See, if until we stop doing this, Agriculture will never move. But we thank God that we've seen our youth moving into agriculture, which is a good thing yeah. because the youth, the age bracket is 70, 30. Yeah, so if you don't motivate them to come, in the next five years, we won't have anybody in the agri sector who we'll have anything to eat. Mm. So these are some of the things I think that we should have. And it's good we've been talking to the presidency. Uh, and the, now we have the Chief of Development Authority, which is going to do wonders. Yeah. I know the we are pushing that the, the board is sworn in by the next two weeks. Once it's done, it changes the whole dynamics, the face of trade growth development in the country. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Doc, what would be your last few words of encouragement, of knowledge that people should know? You know, people want to get into this space, but obviously there's a lot of policies that restrict us as well. You know, how do we move forward with this? Okay. Um it's important to identify exactly where you want to be you know it's like i said agriculture is it's broad but there are prospects um and uh it's important to know uh what role you need to play you know within that sector that is the first thing you need to do you know sort sort it out sort that bit out and then you look for the right help um, you can talk to people who are in that space. Even before you start, you can talk to experts. If it's food processing, obviously you know where to go to because you need to have have an idea of what you're going into. Um, mm. It requires quite a bit as well. I mean, you will be engaging the Food and Drugs Board, Ghana Standards Authority and all of that. So you may not be an expert, but then you need to kind of engage, you know, people who are in that space. Some people wait for so long, you know, they do start doing their own thing and then they want to register a product. And then they mm. have to, if you go to FDA and then you are found wanting, you know, they have some guidelines and standards that you need to you need to abide by. And then it becomes an issue. They, they're thrown off and then they go back and say, okay, maybe I'll not register my product or I will not even do this again. If you do not register your product, there are some shops that you cannot sell your products in. So, um, identify where where you what space you want to be in. Speak to the right people right from the goal. And I just want to say that no amount is too small to start any any business in you know food processing, value addition, product development. The other thing that I want to chip in quickly is I believe that the government, I mean those in farming, those want to go to, into production. There should be a way that you want to add value to what you're producing. A uh, time is coming. Uh, it has already come that you may not be able to solely depend on the raw produce and then you need to find a way to process and i am um advocating for even on on site on farm processing methods and like you know i'm working with tomato farmers um i do not see why a small country like ghana should be the second important tomato paste in the world it beats my mind 
And unfortunately, what is even coming is so substandard. Um, it, it's it's full of additives. It, it's 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 fraud. It's fraudulent. What is happening? The kind of tomato paste they are serving us in this country is below standards. A lot of these companies are ripping off Ghanaian. Right. They're bringing in products um, that will make it easy for them to pay low tariffs as the bulk product instead of finished. When you're bringing in bulk, you're paying about 13% tax. If you're bringing the uh, finished product, about 35%. So they just bring bulk products, could be triple concentrate, and they come and they do their own thing here. They add all kinds of additives. Now, if you see that we're not even having a tomato paste on the market, they're now downgrading it to something we call tomato mix. And if you look at the standards of tomato mix, the total natural soluble solids that are supposed to be in that, it's very low, around 11% compared to about 22% for original tomato paste. So there, you see what's happening. Yet farmers are losing 20 to 40% of tomatoes to post-harvest losses. So I am advocating for putting technologies, and I'm not even talking about complicated technologies. Mm. If you look at Palugu and the other um, Salam Canary who were processing tomato paste, they've all shut down. They had um, you know, huge setups and sophisticated technologies, but they were run down and they couldn't be sustained. I'm looking for simple, appropriate, traditional you know, technologies like drying, where people can employ at their farms. So you are not desperate you know, to sell off your produce at a very cheap price or you're not desperate to leave them on the farm to rot. So that is what I'm advocating for. And I think I'm, 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 I'm you know, employing on the uh, Ministry of Agric and all private sector key stakeholders to help empower these farmers to put convenient technologies in their hands at the farm gate. And this is also going to help empower them to also process what they're already producing so they don't lose out. Thank you so much, Doc. Absolutely powerful message. I, people are agreeing with you and just like, yes, our sentiments um, as well. You know, Fertis, what does COVID-19 bring to shake up our agricultural space in Africa? What can we do right now to think outside the box, to make sure that we are supporting, we are growing, we are nurturing this space to become number one. The focus really uh, is cementing food security for those at the lowest on the totem pole. We got some real issues that need to be addressed. The importation of the amount of food coming in to the country, yes, we need to really change that. And we can produce everything here in Ghana. It's amazing. Your soils are amazing. Yeah, rainfall, adequate rainfall, you can do a lot. Um, but we need to cement the food security belt at the end of the day. Ghana could be the breadbasket of the continent uh, like Zimbabwe was at a time years ago. Z Ghana could be the breadbasket, uh, even regionally, catering in all sorts of ways. So cementing that is at its core. Now, with COVID-19, we already had food security issues. But with COVID-19, what we have is a situation where with social distancing, for instance, labor, a lot of people, the competition for labor is so striking uh, that for planting season, for getting people out, uh, that having people have to pay extra in order to get people out. Um, and there's competition for, for labor. That, that's a real problem. The, the supply chain's drawing up or moving slowly, or charging more money, has been cited uh, by Davis, by other people in the last show. The, all these complexities have had a serious effect. So we need to really look at comprehensive strategies for how to address the supply chain and all the value chains with that. Now, cash crops is one issue, but food crops, addressing the food crops issue is at its core for the staple foods, as well as uh, those areas that have potential to become staple food. So, um, so uh, I can't express it enough. That's this is something that we we're really looking at trying to solve. Yes, um, looking at uh, improving buffer stocks, the storage around it, um, uh, all the complexities around the supply chain from trucking, from uh, making it easier into the port system, but having the checks and controls, uh, social distancing elements required in 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 farm management, in processing, 
the good thing, there's an interesting uh, piece around this. The good thing about agro-processing is that there's a kind of indirect relationship with uh, the COVID-19, with all of the uh, PPEs. And, and for instance, uh, ISO, you know, when you think of a, a HACCP, uh, and good manufacturing practices and, and using certain types of things to cover your gloves and all the rest of it. So, you know, the, the good thing is that that's, that's um, even being looked at all over again within a COVID-19 framework because of the nature of how this thing is transmitted. So, um, but the beauty is that now we really need people to follow in restaurants, in hotels, uh, anywhere where there's food service to adequately and properly address how to attack uh, any type of contamination issues within a COVID-19 world. Mm -hmm. This is a complexity. It's also an opportunity for young people to really think about how to, how to get their head around solving some of that. So, so, um, so uh, I, I, I get uh, really into this because I put together some comprehensive work on how to address this. And, um, and I can't expect it enough that, uh, uh, right now, we really need to think about uh, our processes. This has an application for street foods, for snacks, for all sorts of things. So I'll leave it there. Um, I'll let the other <laughs> I'll guess. Thank uh, you. Because. Thank you so much. I mean, again, um, the questions are a lot. I'm going to take a few questions and we are going to wrap up. So um, let's see what we have. Um, Doc, I think this one is for you. Do you want me to read it out? Yeah, you can read, you can read it out. Mm -hmm. Could we not organize some sort of cooperatives to revive the rundown tomato processing plant? That would we invigorate the economy as well as reinstate the livelihood of the tomato farmers. So basically, I have looked at the um, issue with tomato processing in Ghana and how um, it was uh, pro processing tomato paste was highly dependent on these facilities that have been set, set up. We all know the issue about Palugu. It's more of a political thing. You know, since in Kuma, uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's time, you, one government comes, revamps it, it, it shuts down. Another com government comes, revamps You know, it, it's, just, it's been a cycle. And I am really tired of it, honestly, because there are so many challenges. I mean, challenges to do with um, seed, you know, getting produce to feed the factory, because these are huge plants that require a lot of produce. Sometimes they buy off the farmers. They are not able to pay the farmers on time. Uh, challenges with electricity. I mean, if you look at the issues, there, there's so many that it keeps coming back when you, you and, and I, I basically feel that it's about time that we move past that and put processing of some sort in the hands of the farmers. So basically that inspired the research that I'm doing. And I've come up with a solar dryer that can process tomato powder, which can then be made into a paste. And wow. my, uh, my uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm working with a cooperative, like he, he said, I'm working with, uh, at, at the moment in Chitulaga with a missions group. <laughs> We're building a tomato uh, drying um, factory where we're going to grow the tomatoes and process it into, uh, uh, use some dryers. We have different model dryers that we're going to use. We have quality product. And once we get the product, we bring it to Accra. Um, because it's a foreign group, they're also looking at exporting the product. But I'm looking at replicating this in other regions where you can you can make the tomato you can dry the tomato high quality of course go through some protocols to get that product and then you can sell off people. we have a selling of entrepreneurs i've had people contact me wanting to do this if we have this system in place where people can buy these products and and come to a crowd where, wherever they find themselves and make other value added products from these dry tomato including paste or ketchup or whatever they want to make that we can enhance you know the whole system where you have the farmers producing for people to also use for other products. So this is the concept that I'm working on. I um, started with these farmer groups. I'm also looking at expanding. I'm looking for funding to also um, expand into, into other regions. So it's a very good thing. If you look at the cocoa value chain, I mean, farmers do not sell raw cocoa to the government. They process cocoa in a certain form. They dry and ferment, and it's more shelf-stable that way when it buys off them and export we can have the same model for certain commodities for perishable crops like tomato where the farmers 
since it's not working, you are not, we are not getting uh, these factories to do what they're supposed to do, buy off the farmers and process. We can give these farmers and other entrepreneurs simple technologies, whether they form uh, cooperatives or whatever it is, but they make these products and then they can also sell to individuals or other organizations who want to make these uh, into other uh, tomato products. So yes, I'm currently working with one uh, a cooperative in, in, in Chuchuliga in the north. Fantastic. Can you take the second question? There are small machines to process the tomato and onions on site that will cost less than $250 per unit. I can explore with the doc on the possibility of having some of these machines on site. Okay, we could, you know, uh, talk about this, but I also have know of farmers who are uh, bottle canning tomatoes. So it's not just about, you know, just drying. There are other forms, very simple technology, like the pot and pan method that you can use to bottle can tomatoes. Somebody's making it and selling to schools and, and other okay. institutions. The, the bottom line is let's be let's process the tomatoes ourselves because we are the ones eating so much of it mm. we eat so much tomatoes why should we be exporting tomatoes when we are producing enough 366 uh, metric tons per annum and we are importing over 25 million dollars per annum so i mean here we can talk once once we go off line first okay. this is for you if you can read what's on the screen when China revolutionized the industrialization in 1978, now look how China, how China had gone far. We have enough to break record on these groundbreaking ideas. I get your point. The biggest um, element in this, in my opinion, is the engineering technical capacity needs to be developed in order to do what's necessary. I can't express it enough. Um, uh, for instance, uh, if I'm going to process cocoa, if I'm going to process cashew, whatever I'm going to process, I would like to be able to source that machinery on the African continent. I don't want to have to run to Vietnam or India to source uh, cashew processing equipment. I want to be able to source it here. China has dedicated a significant amount of its GDP in education, science, and technology in order to springboard and South Korea has done the same thing. Many of the uh, Asian tiger countries, Malaysia, a few others, have done the same thing. They've, they've focused on that. That will give you that momentum uh, to have the next generation of engineers to be able to have uh, an agricultural industrial revolution that you are highlighting uh, in the Chinese model. That's my short answer. Okay. And what about this question? It would be great if you could expound on hydroponics uh, facet of farming a bit more. Sure, I can. Uh, are there companies in Ghana where the structures, et cetera, could be purchased? How expensive might be to set up? Um, I'll give you a ballpark in dollars. Uh, it's not terribly expensive to set up. Uh, I also focus on greenhouses heavily and climate-controlled greenhouses. Uh, big difference there. Um, now, uh, in terms of cost, uh, on average, we're looking at for, oh, wait a minute, you're talking hydroponics, not aquaponics, but okay, let's take hydroponics. Hydroponics, it's really the plumbing systems that are the issue. Uh, I like hydroponics, but hydroponics does use chemicals to treat for pests and things like that. And that's an area that I don't, I do natural foods. Uh, but if you want to do that, you're welcome. Uh, but the average cost for a small system. Now, I met, um, oh, I can't remember, this energy company, the energy company in Ghana in, in East, are they in East Lagoon? They had sponsored, I can't remember the name, please forgive me if someone can uh, mention it uh, in the comments. They sponsored a technology set up for youth uh, to catalyze um, youth to produce uh, different types of, technologies in agriculture, and one of which produced a horticultural project, uh, and he, a small-scale system. It was for about uh, all of the, I think, uh, 500 CDs wow. for small-scale horticultural system. And it was an energy company that catalyzed this for youth to get involved in this type of incubator 
to develop uh, agricultural technologies. I think it was a great thing. This is the type of accelerator incubator program that we need more of. And that goes right to that previous question of, of engineers and that Chinese industrial industrialization piece. Mm. Dave, this question's for you. You're mute, you're mute. Yeah. Uh -huh. What is the potential of animal farming? Example, uh, poultry cattle in Africa, slash, uh, Ghana slash Africa. Can it be competitive for versus imports? Uh, yes and no. Um, yes, if they slap a lot of tariffs on the imports, then that will become very competitive. And uh, no, if they leave it as it is, it becomes a problem because currently, you know, the poultry farmers are also faced with these uh, feeding issues and uh, the likes. So their cost of production is very high and doesn't make them so competitive as against the poultry parts that are moving in every second. So basically what needs to be done is for uh, the country to slap some high tariffs on the, the, on the imports. Uh, then that will basically uh, swing to the advantage of our, our local uh, farmers. I also know where the, the cattle producers, you know, currently they are doing the open free grazing. I think that uh, they, we should also look at where uh, we, we could reduce that and to, to make sure that the, 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 the cattle get a bit of weight on time uh, for them to be able to dispose. So one, yes, uh, we should be able to look at the tariffs and make sure that we, our farmers become competitive. Yes, I've seen another one. I mean, you get something mango. Okay, that one is gone. Yes, okay, no, go on. I mean, um, the UK and I, I want to support small scale producers. How do I get connected to label producers, example, dry uh, mango? So you just basically need to pick my number from Identa, then we can link you up to the various associations. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that is all. It's pretty easy to, for you to do that support. Fantastic. You know what? We've gone over two hours. We need to stop. Um, uh, we have over, I would say, about 200 questions <laughs> um, and we can't go through it all um, but last words before we wrap up there's anything Abna you're on mute if you want to unmute if you want to have the last few words um, but I really appreciate your time I think we need to do a series of this that we mentioned I think we might have to go to round three um, because you know it's a big it's a big um, conversation um, and it needs to be split up and broken into pieces for us to understand it and to digest it and to act upon it. Um, but thank you so much to amazing speakers. I don't know if you have one last word that you want to say before we, we wrap up. Well, I think I, I will speak to not just the diaspora actually, but anyone who's either in Ghana or within Africa who is looking or has an interest in agriculture or who's even looking or thinking about their next investment, think about it because actually the opportunities are massive and if you think about where the future is heading i put my money in agriculture thank you thank you so much abna fertis your last words um uh, i received a, a communique uh, today and uh, i'm hoping that it uh, will be much more than what i think it is it's about a new accelerator for agricultural smes um and I think it's to be launched in June. Okay. Um, and uh, I would like to, you know, so for interested parties, uh, there you go. Um, and it's part of, uh, I think, Larry Ellison, the rich IT fella. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a spinoff of his group. So okay. um, I think uh, Ghana must jump in full strength. So I'll get more of the details and then um, please, I'll- Please send the details. Yeah, and I'll send that over to you guys. Um, but and, what, are your last, what are your last words? What do you want to say to people? You know, I, I just say thanks for the opportunity. I just can't express enough. Hey, look, you know, um, I, I've said a lot already, and uh, people have been contacting me, and uh, and we just need to do more of this. Your, your platform, we have lots to say, uh, lots to get out there, lots of information to help people. That's all. That's, I don't have much more than that. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Fertis. And Mr. Davis, what is your last few words that you have to say to people? Okay, let me go back to the uh, uh, slogan, Ghana Beyond A. Uh, mm. For me, I think it becomes a game changer. Mm. Uh, so we seriously need to look at that. I think that the best for us to do as a country to build 20 industry players, just 20 industry players, invest in them and the whole game will change. Mm. That is my advice, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. And I will definitely get you on next time as well. Thank you. Thank you. Doc, <laughs> yeah, you've been amazing today. I just can't tell you how amazing that you have been. Um, what are your last few words to, to the people that are watching? I mean, I just want to comment about COVID. Um, if there's one thing that COVID-19 has taught us, it should be that we are living in uncertain times yeah. and in just a flash, you could have everything come to a standstill. And you, in that case, you would have to look within you and see how you can survive. Now Ghana needs to look within itself and find ways to empower the youth, empower us all to be able to do the best that we need to do in feeding this country. Moving on post COVID, we should look at technologies, employing technologies that would help us extend process and add value to what we have. Now, as you can see, we are not e even able to export. What yeah. do we do with what we are producing? Yeah. This is the time for us to have um, interventions, programs that would empower the youth. We do not have jobs in this country. I mean, we're running out of jobs. Even COVID has, has worsened our plight. So this is a time to encourage the youth to venture into this space. Let's empower the youth. It could be private sector empowerment through government, but let's have keep this conversation going and find a way to keep the youth in agriculture. And I am for post-production because there's a lot of opportunities there. And government should make it easy for them to access information, access technology and advice, and uh, so that we can all build this country. Well, you know, push this country to where it needs to be. Thank you, thank you. That's my last word. Thank you, Doc, thank you so much. And I like the fact that she mentioned the time is now. And you know that that's my slogan, that's my hashtag, that's my that's what I've been saying for the last few weeks, that now is the time. Guys, I've put up on um, the comments page, if you are interested in agriculture, I want to hear from you. Complete the survey um, and, you know, I want to know whether you're interested in pineapples, you know, tomatoes, whatever it is. Um, are you interested in investing? Are you interested in buying land? What is it? Fill out this form and let's start the conversation going. I want to say that if you are in the UK or in Europe and you want to send money back home to Ghana, make sure that you use Tap Tap Send. Um, tap Tap Send, all you have to do is upload it on your phone, send it and then you see a promo code and you enter denta you enter my name and guess what you get five pound extra yay <laughs> and also before i go i want to say a big thank you to vesta london beauty for this amazing lip gloss um check her out online and make sure that you grab one as well and if you are watching tonight please make sure that you subscribe to the youtube um you know press the the subscribe button and you know keep updated with what i'm doing in terms of the, my next interview and all of that what is happening at the moment and if you're watching me on facebook make sure that you click follow well i hope you've enjoyed today's show it's been fantastic it's been insightful and guess what 2.4 billion dollars annually is been spent on food in Ghana alone. Imagine the other countries. Imagine if we stop that, how much money we will retain in Africa. The time is now, guys. Let's look at home. Let's look at Ghana. Let's look at Africa. Let's invest back home. Now is the time. I will see you next week, Thursday. Same time, same place with a new conversation to ignite your passion, to get you going, to get you thinking. See you later. Take care and God bless.
stay safe.